Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd Road. Welcome to it. I'm your host, John Justice. Thank you so much for checking out another episode this week. As always, if you want to email talkshownerd at gmail.com. You can also leave a comment on YouTube if you happen to be listening there. Be sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel or wherever you listen to Depeche Mode, the podcast, whatever platform you're on. Not a lot going on in terms of news this week as the band is about ready to come off hiatus here for the fourth and final leg of the tour overseas. We'll continue to track the tour and any set list changes if they occur as it gets underway again uh, next week. We do have a lot of listener feedback to get to this week, and I'm looking forward to um, sharing what you have to say and commenting on it here in just a moment. Uh, The only item that I wanted to talk about today was this article that I found, and I edited it down because there's a lot of technical jargon in the piece, so I pulled out some of the more relevant items that we all can uh, relate to, but it's an article on mixing this current Memento uh, Mori tour, and I wanted to share with you some rather interesting details from this article. From January 16th, Mixing Depeche Mode's Memento Mori World Tour. Depeche Mode knows a little something about music for the masses. Eh, I see what they did there. Deep in the middle of a year-long world tour uh, that kicks off leg four in London on January 22nd, the group continues to bring its unique blend of synth-pop, goth, alternative, rock, and more to sold-out stadiums and arenas. The band, now a duo of vocalist Dave Gaughan and multi-instrumentalist and vocalist Martin Gore, has been on the road in support of 2022's Memento Mori, and supporting Depeche Mode's modus operandi at every step of every step of the way has been the UK-based audio provider of Britannia Row Productions, which now has worked with the band for 30 years. Along for the ride are the FOH engineer Jamie Pollock, monitor engineer Mike Gibbard, each ensuring that their mixes reflect what's happening on stage. With clarity and purpose. Depeche Mode has never held the recorded versions of its songs sacrosanct, as evidenced by the bumper crop of remixes the group has released over the years. Bringing that philosophy to the FOH position, Pollock had to develop each song's mix not necessarily to re- reproduce the recorded version or simply give it a more live feel, but instead to best support the song's latest evolution. I could play you one of their songs that everyone knows, mute the lead parts, and listen to what's underneath it, and you'd say, that's not the same song, he said laughing. The music is so creative, and there's so many layers to it. It's quite brilliant. I spent some time with Daniel Miller, the founder of Mute Records, who discovered them, and we had conversations about how some songs came about in the studio. You think you know what drives a a song, and you interpret it that way, but there's definitely been times where I was wrong. He was able to tell me about a song's creative process, and once you understand the fundamentals of what it was about, you can then play on it in the mix. I think they look for things that make it exciting, a little different. We recently started playing Black Celebration, and how we're doing it now is very different, and they wanted that. I think they were looking for something a bit new and fresh, and that's the evolution. Finding the right ways to present the band's music to crowds and the band itself has been unusually gratify- an unusually gratifying experience for the two engineers, both of whom are electronic music artists in their own right and were initially influenced by the band. It's one of the best tours I've ever done in my life. It's a box tick band for me, and they're absolutely lovely people to work for, says, Gib- uh, says Gibbard. For me to come into this and really deliver how they want to hear Depeche Mode on stage, I'm really enjoying it, and they're having a lot of fun. 
I don't have any further details to share with regard to the potential of what we may get later this year, especially when it comes to the potential for a box set, those four unreleased tracks. I do hope that we get another comprehensive documentary. I'm really interested in seeing not only the tour aspect of what I was able to to share with you, but also just the recording of the of the album. There was an interview that was done on YouTube, and I saw a portion of it. Um, I'm sorry, let me back up. There was an interview done. It was by Apple Music. I forgot who the who the host was. It was one of the better interviews that I've seen of the of the band. As a matter of fact, arguably, it was one of the best interviews that I'd seen done with uh, with with the band because there were so many interviews that just kept asking the same questions over and over again. Be that as it may, I I watched. Um, this portion of it online. And I remember listening to it when it first came out. For some reason, though, this portion of the interview didn't, I didn't remember. And I I don't know if just because it was, you know, about a year ago and I'd forgotten that portion of it and I, you know, only listened to it one time or, or not. But in this portion of the interview that I watched online with Martin and Dave and this host, they got into the details of losing, um, Fletch and a little bit more of the creative process. And it just really had me pining for the documentaries that we used to get, that we stopped getting when Delta Machine uh, came out. They kind of began to slow down with playing the Angel, and then it just we got nothing after that. So I'm really hoping that we get another good, comprehensive documentary. And I, as I've mentioned on previous episodes, I'd hope that we get one for Delta Machine and definitely Spirit um, as well. But I love that insight into... The creative process beyond the band, you know, they create this wonderful music. They have producers and engineers and other songwriters around them and Richard Butler who helped to go and craft this wonderful masterpiece of Memento Mori. And then when you go out on tour, it's this collection of individuals that are creative in their own right that are able to go and take what Martin and Dave and the rest of the live band are able to to produce on stage and bring it to the level that we all expect and enjoy. I just, I love that creative part of it and how many creative elements are involved to create this amazing, unique, and wonderful experience. One more comment before I dive into listener feedback this week. When I saw the band with my buddy Matt in in Denver... I remember the moment when they're with his sister and and his daughters, uh, and I couldn't remember at what point in the show it it took place, but I remember there was a moment when Dave came over with us being in the front row and he dropped his microphone down and we all, you know, stood up on our on our tiptoes and got as close to the mic as we could and sang along and how that I was just like, Oh my gosh, this moment is, is amazing. I can't believe this is this is happening. So I finally found a couple of videos that were shot, um, obviously from individual cell phones. And uh, it was during Walking in My Shoes, which was obviously early in the in the set. And I finally found uh, the moment, some distant shots, but you could still see all of us huddle up around the mic. And you could almost hear my voice singing Try, Wa- Try Walking in My Shoes and you know, I, I watched it and just got goosebumps. I just it was it's a it is a Depeche Mode memory like so many that I will just never ever forget. Many of you have written in over the course of the past week, and I really do appreciate the listener feedback again. You can always email talkshownerd at gmail.com uh, or leave a comment up on YouTube. You are all friends of the show. So as I work through, just want to let you know. First off, we hear from Amy in Worcestershire who writes this. Greetings from the UK. Definitely keeping my fingers crossed for some DM box set action later this year. Not really predictions, but here are some of my ponderings. I'm in two minds with a Memento Mori documentary. I would certainly be fascinating. Um, be a a fascinating insight into what impact losing Fletch had on the mood and the atmosphere in the studio during the recording and then having to handle promos and the tour as a duo. That said, 
Could the band have declined the documentary for the same reasons, meaning it's still too raw? Dave and Martin were quite open during the interviews about their desire to get on with the album after Fletch's passing, so I imagine contributing to a documentary could have brought both pain and or peace. Number two, if Memento Mori, a deluxe album, appears around the end of May, could we expect Live in Hamburg to coincide with the 40th anniversary of the concert in December? Add that to the Christmas list. Best wishes to you and all the friends of the show, uh, Amy. I have a little bit more to say with regard to uh, Live in uh, in Hamburg uh, here in a moment based off of another listener feedback that we uh, that we got. So I'm going to hold off my comments on uh, on that front let's go here to uh, matt uh, ellerbeck who says great episode i can't wait for what 2024 will bring and i love all the dm and dave gone album and releases each one is a beautiful sonic journey next up we have chad who writes this i hope this message finds you well it does although it's been cold as all get out here in minnesota as of late single digits below zero temperatures not my cup of tea can't do a whole lot. I've been thinking about how we're both diehard fans, but differ on our least loved song from Memento Mori. For me, Never Let Me Go holds a special place with its captivating beat, melodic bridges to watch our dreams unfold, including a second bridge with the We Will Be Beacons and the unforgettable guitar riff. It's a true jam. Interestingly, Caroline's Monkey doesn't quite resonate for me, though it's not entirely skippable. Yeah, we kind of just flip flop those. I feel the same way, but in reverse. All right. Not entirely skippable. It's um, it just doesn't speak to me. We do find common ground with people are good. I was hoping it would become a single for some fantastic remixes. Do you think the band knows how? awesome 8 to 12 uh do you think the band knows how awesome songs 8 through 12 are weird that of those only speak to me was played live yeah it's an interesting choice in the songs that they decided to play live and i wonder if it's a matter of just what they potentially tried to practice or just in terms of um, you know, what they rehearsed and what they knew would work and what wouldn't work, what would be too much of a strain on Dave's vocals. In that Apple Music interview that I mentioned a moment ago, which is why I don't recall seeing this portion of the interview because I think I would have remembered this part of it because he specifically mentions one song from Memento Mori and it was Don't Say You Love Me. And he talked about it as if they would be performing it live and I thought that was really interesting. Um, Petzitsky writes this. Hello, John. It would be fun, if possible, if you could record yourself when you are listening to the four new DM tracks for the first time in earphones, for example, and also commenting them in real time, commenting on them in real time. Then maybe afterwards you could play the result on your podcast. I got this idea when two Swedish Iron Maiden fans from the Maiden Podden podcast was commenting on an album track from Maiden's latest album that was released in advance. It was fantastic to hear their initial reaction, and I think this would be the same. Keep up the great work. I will absolutely do that. I think this is a fantastic idea. Something else that I'm going to be doing on the show is sometime in the near future, I found a channel, I think it was the Charismatic Singer, this female vocal analyst who isn't familiar with a lot of alternative music. She did two Depeche Mode videos. The first one she did was Enjoy the Silence, and the second one she did was Never Let Me Down Again. Fascinating insight on YouTube. I encourage you to go and find her into the songs, and she definitely knows music and its, um, its, it, how, and its complexities. But it was, it was really interesting hearing this person that was so unfamiliar with Depeche Mode comment on the music. And it got me thinking about doing something very similar while I'm not a music expert uh, in as much as she was in knowing the details of how things were created. I thought it would be fun to take some of my favorite tracks and break them down sort of through instinctive reaction out of instinctive reaction of what makes those songs special to me. So that's something that I'm planning on doing. Um, in the in the future, you know, we'll see if it resonates, if you guys dig it. And if you do, I'll continue doing it. And if you don't, eh, no harm, no foul. 
Uh, Fernando Poo writes this. I was commenting on how much I disliked the whole to feed video last week. The whole to feed video was directed by Tim and Eric, the comedy duo. I had no idea. I never heard the background on that. Why would they do that? <laughs> that video, I just cannot. I just cannot handle. All right. My buddy Matt, who I mentioned earlier, writes this. If you have time on your pod today, please pass this along as a public uh, as a public service announcement to the listeners. Matt in Denver. People, do yourself a favor and heed this New Year's resolution. Stop what you're doing. Put on Black Celebration. Turn up the volume and listen from beginning to end. Greatest album of all time from the greatest band of all time. Just incredible. Depeche Mode rules. You're welcome. He's not wrong. And we can all kind of argue when we have our own selective favorites. But doing that, it really is a good idea. That album is so good. It 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 it, it really is a classic. I know that I put that trifecta, the trilogy, the holy trilogy of music for the masses and um Violator and Songs of Faith and Devotion, but you can slide that scale <laughs> kind of, you know, backwards and forwards if you want, including Ultra or backing up to Black Celebration very, very easily and including, um, you know, and then reward in there as well. There's absolutely, yeah, but Black Celebration is spot on. Thank you, uh, Matt, as always. Appreciate it. And uh, lastly, Dave Fulton. Dave Fulton's got a lot to say. Got a lot from Dave Fulton, and it's great stuff. And thank you so much to everybody who's uh, who's uh, written in this week. Uh, Dave Fulton writes this, and this is kind of a series of uh, different messages that I got from Dave, who discovered the podcast recently. And much like uh, my buddy uh, uh, Rob Rome from the Global Depeche Fan Group, it appears that we were running in the same circles in Southern California at the time. So I'm sure that Dave... Uh, myself and Rob all crossed paths un, un, unknowingly back in the back in the day. Dave writes this: "I love your idea of featuring the new tracks within the context of the album rather than mere add-ons. In times past, there was a sense that certain songs were better B-sides than album tracks. I don't think that's true of all the non-album tracks. Certainly." All of the B-sides for Speak and Spell are better than some of those that were featured on the album. And the Violator B-sides work uh, would work quite well in the context of the album, in my opinion. A track like Caroline's Monkey seems a bit off the most psych furs of the Butler Pen songs. So I'd be curious to hear what they felt they didn't want to include. If they were already looking outside the band for help with songwriting, I had assumed Martin Gore was struggling for a bit. So here's an interesting tidbit that I wondered whether or not I wanted to share on the show. Okay, Now, anybody can go and hear this for themselves, but I don't know if it potentially has the... There's a possibility that me telling you this could change your perception of the album. But like I, like I said, the band said this out in the open in public in an interview, so I'll share it with you because I was surprised by this. In that Apple Music interview, Martin was talking about working with David Butler. He made a comment, and I'd heard this before, that I'm scared, not David Butler, Richard Butler from The Psychedelic First. He made a comment that Richard Butler had actually reached out to him many years prior about working together and they were never able to make it happen. During COVID, Richard Butler worked out, you know, reached out to Martin again and said, "Hey, we should write some songs together." The initial plan was that they were going to release a, a, an album essentially that was something completely different of Richard Butler and Martin Gore songs together. And Martin liked the song so much that he went back to Richard and said, "Hey, how would you feel about me turning these into Depeche Mode tracks? Because the songs were so good, Martin was afraid that it would just be passed off like a side project and it wouldn't reach as many people. So those songs on Memento Mori that ended up becoming Depeche Mode songs almost were a a Butler Gore side project. And I, would, I was kind of taken aback by that. Now, clearly... Without having heard the demos, those tracks ended up becoming Depeche Mode songs. There's also an argument to be made that Martin writes those songs, Dave writes the songs, but the producers 
have a huge say in the way that these songs end up sounding. So any argument that I might be presenting that would say these aren't really true Depeche Mode songs and the reason for that is because Martin was planning on releasing a solo album with Richard Butler with these songs and just made him Depeche Mode songs instead. That kind of falls flat, at least in my opinion, when you consider the number of creative people beyond Martin and Dave that are responsible for the songs sounding the way that they do. And ultimately, Dave and Martin sign off on how those songs are going to sound and then call them Depeche Mode. I was just taken a bit aback. I was like, whoa, that would have been different. I am dying to hear, say, like, Ghosts Again or Don't Say You Love Me with Richard Butler singing them. I'm assuming he must have done the vocals for it, for those for those songs. Um, and I believe that was actually stated at some point in time, that when David heard the tracks, they were very distinct because it had Richard Butler singing them. I can almost hear, I'm not that familiar with the psychedelic first, but I can almost hear Richard Butler's voice attached to Ghosts Again, which, as I've mentioned many times, is one of my one of my favorites. Let's move on. Dave, uh, Dave's got more uh, comments here to share. Personally, I have to think that the band doesn't want the footage from the Hamburg concert, the world we live in and live in Hamburg, out there because it's so old and the video effects are cheesy. And they may feel the audio is muddy and not representative of where they are as a band now. Maybe they'll wait until retirement. I was trying to track down the Clive Richardson responsible for shooting the original concert, as well as many videos for the band, including Just Can't Get Enough, the only official DM footage to feature Vince Clark. I know he is not the Clive who died in 1998, who was a composer, nor the Clive Richardson who seems to currently work in TV and movie production. As it relates to the CD and DVD set for The World We Live In and Live in Hamburg that I mentioned last week, Dave is keen to point out, and I wasn't aware of this, that this is not an official um, import release. Uh, the Japanese market did get an official Laserdisc back in the day and a very decent bootleg, oh the irony, of that concert on CD seems to have taken the audio from the Laserdisc. How many times did I consider buying a laser displayer in the 90s? It always seemed like I was only going to do it for the sake of one or two releases. Blade Runner, for example. Hat tip to you, sir. It was such a financial undertaking, though. Then you think, oh, I should have a better monitor TV set for this. I should have better speakers, and I probably should invest in soundproofing, and then you're down the rabbit hole. And then lastly, David writes, so 2024 could be a year of momentum mori. <laughs> I get it. Seriously, as pessimistic as I am by the nature I've been uh, predicting the last album since Violator, how many bands of that era have really stuck around? The Cure, U2, that's about it unless you count scattered releases, regroupings, and recapitulations for OMD, Duran Duran, and Human League. Between aging, the death of Fletch, and the general cadence of so many careers, it was probably a pretty good bet that Memento Mori could be the coda of the career with maybe a farewell tour. But if Martin Gore and Dave love the work and love the process, why not carry on? I would say, hey, look at the Rolling Stones. But DM are much more interesting musically than the Stones, so it's not even a good comparison. I suppose you could compare them to you 2 but even they are too conventional. The Cure is essentially Robert Smith's psalm book. So that leaves Depeche Mode. An exquisite, eccentric, and unique band that is as weird as I am. So, carry on, boys. Well, really, honestly, as weird as all of us when you think about it. Thank you so much for checking out this week's episode. Thank you to everybody who wrote in. Do as my buddy Matt said. Go listen to Black Celebration front to back really, really loud. Hey, if you like science fiction, you obviously love Depeche Mode, and you're a reader, I hope you'll support my nerd world and check out my space opera series, science fiction space opera series in Bark. It's set in the future where air and space flight culture has replaced car culture, and it is inspired in part by Depeche Mode. Life in the so-called space age, the world that we live in and life in general, 
Depeche Mode actually plays a large part in the underlying themes of the story. The main character himself, Taft Guardia, is a massive Depeche Mode fan at a time when the music of the 80s through the 2000s is nostalgic and popular among the characters of the story. Think Ready Player One, but in a science fiction space opera setting. They feature references to Depeche Mode both direct and indirect while telling an exciting science fiction space opera saga. Book one in the series, the story goes as follows. Katha Morrow's usually steady hands shook just enough as she zipped her flight suit. After receiving a cryptic message from her late aerospace engineer father detailing an undisclosed location, she's desperate to reach the destination with fellow pilot Taft Guardia. Unprepared for what would happen next, they make a shocking discovery. Meanwhile, an industrial accident inside a D-Corp, military and civilian spacecraft factory, sparks a global evacuation as the mega corporation's ruthless leader attempts to exploit the disaster. Unwittingly tied to the catastrophe, Katha Taft and their ragtag crew must solve the mystery of her father's past, having found what may be the only hope of saving Earth's evacuees from annihilation. If you like your science fiction to be epic, filled with some Depeche Mode, romance, and action, Embark is perfect for you. It is written for adults, but it's perfectly suitable for kids 11 and up. Pick up Embark Book 1 today, available in ebook, Kindle Unlimited, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook narrated and produced by me, John Justice. On Amazon.com, search for Embark and John J.O. and Justice, or go to My Nerd World. Net. Thank you so much for checking out this week's episode, and I'll be back again next week. Until that time, I hope you are happy, you are healthy, and you are safe. And I'll talk to you again then. Bye. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd World.